So I'm Edith Herba. I'm CEO and co-founder of Launch Darkly, and this is my first time ever in Norway. So I am super excited. And I'm also very excited that I flew in yesterday and they gave me the slot at 4 p.m., which is 7 a.m. my time. So I'm kind of waking up right now, <laughs> as opposed to like a slot earlier when I think I would have had to had a big pot of coffee right here. Um, super excited to be in Norway, super excited to talk about feature flags today. Um, so first, a little bit more about me. Um, I, uh, I am CEO and co-founder of LaunchDarkly, which is a company that makes a feature flag management platform. Uh, besides that, I also co-host a podcast on continuous delivery called To Be Continuous with Paul Bigger, uh, founder of CircleCI. Uh, so if you like the talk, uh, listen to our podcast. I also write articles for uh, InfoQ, ReadWrite, and VentureBeat about just software development. Um, my background is I started off as, a, as an engineer. Um, so I got an engineering degree from Harvey Mudd College, which is a school near Los Angeles. And I was an engineering program manager for many years. Um, like all engineers, I eventually decided that I was far smarter than my product manager. And how hard can this be? <laughs> uh, so I was then a product manager. And within the first two months of being a product manager, I found out how wrong I was. Um, product management is a really hard job. Uh, the mistake I'd made is I thought uh, product managers just do what their engineers tell them to do. Um, what I found out is that there's actually a whole world out there that makes product management very hard. Um, not learning from my prior lesson, I then decided that how hard can marketing be? Um, so I then went into marketing. Uh, I actually really like marketing. Uh, marketing has a lot more logic than you think. Um, you basically can measure a lot of efficiency of campaigns. So engineering fun, product management hard, marketing fun, and I've basically seen the software life cycle from every angle. Uh, now at my own company, I've, you know, we've, was this, when we started with two people, I got to do everything else that I hadn't already done. Um, so what I've seen from when I started, and I started working in 1999, which is almost 20, as a full-time job, and before that I had programmed in Visual Basic. Um, so back when I started out, releases were very seldom. Uh, so I remember uh, one of my first jobs was at Epicentric, which made portal management software, and we were considered really fast because we would do a release every year. Um, this was really fast because our competitors, like SAP, would do a release every three years. And right now you're either thinking, wow, these dinosaurs, or, huh, I remember those days. Um, the really painful thing about these long releases was how hard it took to get feedback. Um, so we were basically making back then, uh, we didn't call it on-prem, we just called it software. Uh, so you had to work a whole year on your software, wait for people to come, release to manufacturing, wait for people to come to a download, download site and install it, and then start using it, and then give you feedback. So basically the software you're working on right now, somebody would probably see about a year and a half to, eight, to two years after you started writing it. This was really painful for a lot of different reasons. Um, Perhaps the biggest one that finally kind of changed this was that, number one, there's somebody who's a little quicker than you out there, nipping at your heels. And number two, these huge releases got kind of a, got to be a burden. Uh, so I was up at Microsoft last month for the big Microsoft build convention, and Microsoft at one day had been kind of the king of the three-day release cycles. The way they described it is one year to spec, one year to build, one year to test. And what they discovered that was this was forcing them down this path of they'd get a year and a half into it, and the world had changed around them. But they were already too committed to these features, and they were stuck. They had to ship them because people had worked on them. They were already in scope. They were already in flight. And then they would ship uh, Clippy, which nobody liked. You know, because, hey, we already have this dancing paperclip. We don't have time to build anything else. Uh, so kind of the new world is weekly release cycles. Um, and I say weekly, there's a huge spectrum. I talk to a lot of different people out there. Uh, some people ship 20 times a day. Some people tr ship 20 times an hour. Some people are right now moving from you know, every three months to every, every two weeks. 
the only right cadence is the one that works for your business. But once you get that cadence, double down on it. So how does this all feed into feature flags? Uh, so here's a quote from Microsoft. Um, so feature flags, how many people already use feature flags? Great. Um, so feature flags are a technique, basically, where you can make part of your application visible to some people and not to other people. This sounds really simple at first, and I'm going to talk through some of the implications of what that means. And then I'm going to talk about how not to use feature flags, because um, feature flags could also get you into a lot of trouble. So really what feature flags allow you to do is have a unified code base and choose who gets what access to what. And uh, so this is um, from one of our customers, Alassian, who talks about how they use LaunchDarkly. I'll reiterate that uh, you don't have to use LaunchDarkly to use feature flags. We help you use them better, but you don't have to use us. We're just a, tech we're just a way to manage them. All right. So the simplest way that feature flags reduce risk is as a kill switch. Um, so the old day of building software was you would have uh, a physical release that you would put on a production server and cross your fingers. Uh, the reason why you're crossing your fingers is that however, however much you test stuff before production, you're never going to find anything. I mean, you're never going to find everything. Uh, and this is for a variety of reasons. Um, so I most recently was a uh, uh, at TripIt as product, and we would test everything in our nice labs in San Francisco. You know, we'd have our, our, pro, our BlackBerry phones, our Apple phones, our Microsoft phones, and we would be testing everything. In the real world, we had 10 million users who were flying all over the world with low battery, and a flaky uh, internet connection, and uh, just all these things that we had never, could never anticipate. So as soon as you put something down in the real world, people are going to use your software in a way that even if you could anticipate it, you can't always test it, and something's going to happen. What a feature flag allows you to do is act as an easy kill switch. Um, so for example, if there's something where suddenly you find that uh, if, if there's a new version of Android, for example, that doesn't work well and with, uh, your, own, with your application, you could say, hey, you know what? Nobody with that Android version can see this uh, feature anymore. This honestly gives you a great deal of peace of mind. I know it does. Me. Uh, the opposite is if you don't have a kill switch, something bad happens out of the field, and you're basically stuck. It's 3 AM. Something's broken. You get a pager duty alert. There's a scramble of, uh, well, I'm not going to swear because it's my first time in Norway, but there's this panic loop of, what happened? Who could fix it? What's the last known build? What are we going to do? And it's a fundamental fact of human nature that when you get into this panic mode, your brain often makes bad decisions. Uh, so some of the worst software releases mistakes I've seen happen is when, um, and I'll, I'll own this up, this happened to me, uh, we, shipped something, we shipped something that was actually destroying customers' data. So we said, oh, let's, let's do a fix pack. So we did this really hurried fix pack. That fix pack broke this other thing over here that we hadn't really thought about because we were just ready to do this one thing. OK, let's do this other fix pack. Within about eight hours, we'd gone from A to H before we finally contained the bleeding. And this wasn't a fun experience for anybody. So the, if, if we'd had a feature flag back then, what we could have simply said is, you know what, something is broken. Let's stop it. Let's assess how we're going to fix it. Let's think about this, and let's have a clean fix. So using kill switches basically allow you to decouple feature rollout from code deployment so that you can really take your time if something goes wrong. Uh, a really good technique to use with feature flags is a controlled rollout. Um, this is basically where you're rolling out a feature from 0 to 100% of your traffic. Uh, the preferred time to use this is if it's anything performance related. Uh, you, for example, might have a search query that performs really well when one person hits it every two hours, like you might in a QA environment, but completely degrades if suddenly you have a million people querying every five minutes. Uh, so a controlled rollout allows you to slowly push something out to your user base, see how they respond, and also turn it back down. Uh, so PagerDuty, 
I uh, actually talked about this in another talk I saw, which was awesome, which um, they use feature flags to roll stuff out in the morning, and then at lunchtime, they turn it back to zero. And when asked about why at lunchtime it was zero, they're like, well, we don't want to respond to an incident at lunchtime. You know, like, so let's, let's, I want to go to lunch in peace. <laughs> Sounds really obvious, right? Like, you want to go to lunch in peace. So with controlled rollouts, what they could do is they could turn it up to 25% and 30% before lunch, turn it off at lunch, come back, and then after, during the afternoon, continue to monitor. Um, what controlled rollouts really let you do is make software releases work for you instead of vice versa. Uh, another really fun thing to do with feature flags is that you could give early access to your best customers. Uh, again, Microsoft does this a lot. Um, they call them canary releases. What they do is they can have people opt in to different rings of a release. Um, so if you're basically the, the person who wants the latest and greatest, no matter how flaky it is, you could get that. You could actually go into Visual Studio now and flip on different features that you want early access to. Uh, a surprising thing that uh, I found is that people really like getting early access to things. Uh, we use this internally at LaunchDark, my own company. Uh, we had an, a new SSO feature we were building, and people were so excited about getting it early that they were really willing to give us a lot of early feedback. Um, we also did this a lot at TripIt. Uh, we had this new feature, which was extremely risky at the time, which was we were scraping your Gmail inboxes. So we basic, basically OAuthing into your Gmail inbox, uh, looking for travel confirmations, and then importing them into TripIt. Uh, this was considered very risky at the time because basically nobody else was doing this. OAuth was pretty new. We didn't know uh, how big people's inboxes would be, and we didn't know the quality of our own algorithms very thoroughly. So what we could do is we could opt in, have people about five to ten very early, tr early adopter travelers select to be part of this, uh, it gave us a lot of feedback, and that was great. So I was the product person at the time, and what we found out was that uh, we could do some really quick algorithm switches, such as uh, at the beginning we would scrape anything that looked like a ticket. So, and a lot of, uh, like we would, for example, accidentally scraped uh, gift certificates uh, and advertisements, which people didn't like. But it was fine because we had these early adopters who just kind of said, hey, these are garbage, throw them out. Early adopters could be your best friends. The other thing you could do is you could block people from getting early, early releases. I just said right now that people love getting early releases. There are also people who hate getting early releases. Uh, usually this will happen in a B2B company where you have some customers who, who have a lot of training around your current features, and they do not want to get a new release. Just no. Just don't bug them. Uh, Stripe is a great example of this. They're not a LaunchDarkly customer, but I know that they, um, Stripe is the service for an API that powers a lot of, uh, basically, uh, credit card systems. If you have a bartender out of the field with an iPad, you do not want to subtly change the entire layout on them. This could cause chaos. So what they'll do is they'll block a lot of features uh, to the general population so they can get them exactly right before they push them out. Um, so blocking features is actually really powerful. Another way you could do this is you could block different IPs. You could block different email addresses. Uh, you could just block whoever you want. Um, some great use cases for this are CEOs. Sometimes you don't want them to see stuff till it's really baked, because they'll give you a lot of half-baked commentary. Uh, you might want to block tech blogs. For example, TechCrunch, you, you don't, might want, want them to see a feature early. Uh, you might just want to also block, for example, if you know a competitor is looking at your software, you could block their IP, you could block an email domain, you could block anything that you want. So feature flags in some are this really great technique to really decouple, um, to, to decrease risk of a software. Uh, so let me, now that I've talked about how great feature flags are, let me talk about how they can be extremely dangerous um, and how you should be really careful when you're using them. OK, so I gave you the bright, shiny coin of feature flags. Now I'm going to tell you the dark side. Uh, 
Feature flags are really a great technique if you're really trying to have a unified code base where you don't want to have a long-lived branch out there that's kind of going to cause a lot of hassle when you merge it back in. However, if you're not vigilant about how you're using feature flags, and if you use them poorly, you can have a real disaster on your hand. So Knight Capital was a US firm. Uh, I see a couple nods. Where uh, a poor use of feature flags caused them to lose about half a billion dollars in, in an hour. So half a billion US dollars, which is basically, if I get my conversion right, four billion krona? I think that's right. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money for software to lose very quickly. Uh, so how they lost it, and this is basically the gyrations that they caused, was, and this full, I wrote this full article for InfoQ with the full story if you want it. Uh, they had a feature flag called powder peg in their code that they had never pulled out. Somebody thought powder peg did something else. So when they shipped it, when they pushed a version of software, this, this thing should always have been off. It was basically something they used on a staging server because they wanted to test that trades were executing very rapidly. So if they turned on powder peg, it, it basically executed trades very quickly together. Uh, this is great in staging if you're trying to simulate a real load. However, when they pushed it to production with it on, it was the, the system didn't know that they were not on a staging server. And what happened was they started executing trades extremely rapidly, which is what you can see right here. Um, basically distorted the market, uh, throwing in chaos into the, the um, trading. When they tried to fix this, they actually turned another feature flag on and further destabilized the system. So it took them about two hours to fix this whole thing. And in the meantime, uh, a, a lot of money was lost. There's a lot of lessons to learn from this, and I'm going to walk through them one by one. All right, ambiguously named flags. Uh, never have a flag that has an ambiguous name. Powder peg is an awful name. Like, if, uh, if you're starting to use feature flags, think of a good naming convention from the beginning. Uh, this is kind of like the, the reverse of, uh, it's really common when you had, back when you named servers, to give them cutesy names you know, like Orion or an Apollo, do not do this with feature flags. Never have a situation where you have, oh, this feature flag named Apollo, what does that do? Like, don't, don't give them code names that somebody could mistake, particularly when they're tired. Um, have a really clear convention of, for example, uh, you know, server side setting and then what it actually does. Um, assume that whoever is looking at your feature flags, including you, two weeks later, will have no idea what it does. Uh, this can also prevent the case, and I've seen this happen, um, where you have two different teams, they assume that the flag does different things. I, I heard this story in London where two different teams both thought their feature flag could, controlled their part of the software. So you had a back-end team and a front-end team, and every release they would basically alternate flipping it. <laughs> Took them a long time to sort this out. Um, never, never, never allow yourself to get in a situation where people can be confused. And even if they are really clear, people will still be confused. Uh, so try to comment out names and explain them. Uh, overused flags. Um, I, it happens. Um, so what happened in this case, I, I love this, this is a real sign I got off the internet, but um, in this case, I'm an engineer, and you know what probably happened is that they have a single fuse that's controlling both their elevator and a light switch. Sounds great when you're wiring something up, right? Not so great if you're in the elevator when somebody wants to turn the lights off. Uh, you know, make very clear when you're using a flag what it should and should it control. Uh, don't have it threaded throughout. It, it, don't have it threaded throughout and controlling random things that might not sync. On the other hand, sometimes you do want to have kind of a master switch. Um, a really great use case for this is, uh, for example, if you're doing a rebranding. So when you, if you do a rebranding, which is pretty much a, hopefully a once every two to three things and not a once every six month thing, you'll have a lot of assets that you want to control with the same feature flag. You know, you have all your email templates, you'll have all your front end, uh, you probably will have some um, back-end coding. So 
think very carefully about why you're having one feature flag control a lot of things. Uh, sometimes it's a good idea. Uh, sometimes it can put you in a lot of trouble. Uh, conflicting flags. Uh, so this is a US traffic sign. Um, do you know if you could park here or not? No. Um, this can happen if you have different groups working on uh, different, feature, different parts of the system. And usually this happens when they're actually all kind of controlled off their own config file. Uh, what can happen really easily is, uh, partic particularly if you have this distributed team, is one person can think they're controlling something, one person can think they're controlling something, and the result is chaos. Uh, for example, if you have a back end and a front end team, and you have a new feature, like to go back to the search one, and one thinks they'll control who can see the search via just uh, turning off that box, and the other thinks they'll control the search via a nice error message. If you have two flags which both people think are controlling something, they start conflicting. The most benign thing is it just doesn't appear. Uh, if it's something more serious, for example, something in your billing process, it can actually take you a long time to figure out why whatever is happening isn't the right way. Uh, so when you are using flags, I think this goes back to the ambiguously named and the overused, uh, put them in a common place. Usually where people run into trouble is if each, uh, each team has their own, not only in their own naming conventions, but in their own system. Uh, config files are usually the worst offender. Uh, config files sound fun until they're not. Uh, the, the issue with config files is that you start to proliferate them, and they're very hard then to track down that this, this config file is actually controlling something else that broke your thing over there, that then triggered into this, and now it's 4 a.m., and you're like, what the fuck? All right. Uh, I, I don't know how many. I don't know if these are funny. If you're not American, but um, this is this is a real story. Um, this was a content management company that I know well. Um, they had a feature flag, so they'd started using feature flags pretty much at their beginning, and they got a little more sophisticated. They actually built kind of an admin panel. Uh, so a, a simple UI so that anybody in their company could turn feature flags on and off. Sounds great, right? You don't have to go bug your developer anymore. You don't have to depend on a config file. There's this easy admin thing. However, it was a little too easy. Um, so at the end of the day, feature flags are really controlling core functionality when your application. And they basically had this admin page that anybody in the company could turn on and off any feature. This was really benign until it wasn't. Uh, so one day, suddenly, in this, nobody could upload a file anymore. This is actually a big deal if you're a content management system and nobody can upload a file. Uh, so there was these panicked calls to, to customer support and sort of escalating and got actually the CEO. The CEO calls the company and says, you know, we need to figure this out immediately. Nobody can upload a file. After about, I think they told me it was three hours, they figured out that they had uh, an old feature flag that was controlled on the admin page that somebody had accidentally turned off. And this feature flag stopped people from uploading. Uh, I'm sure they'd originally had good intentions of putting this in. Uh, I think they had wanted to throttle traffic. You know, if they were just simply overwhelmed by spammers, they wanted to be able to shut off all uploads. However, they'd left this thing in where somebody could basically cripple their entire system. Uh, so, they had to then, you know, just simply turn it back on. Everything started working again. But this was three hours of like people calling the CEO being extremely upset. Uh, <laughs> the funniest part of the story to me was I asked, well, did they then take the feature flag off the UI? And they said, no. We didn't know what it really worked for, so we had to leave it there. I was just like, oh. I'm like, did you put more security on it? And they're like, no. We just put this big label that said, uh, do not ever touch this button. <laughs> and then they kind of put like, and then uh, about, they said about six months later, it happened again where nobody could upload files. And this time they knew that they just had to go to this feature flag on the, on the UI and turn it back on. It was like, well, did you finally take it off? And they're like, no, we put even bigger letters. Because <laughs> we, we didn't, like, I was just like, ah, oh, I've... Um, 
you know, so don't, don't get yourself in this situation where you're letting everybody control your application and you don't even know who. They never figured out who flipped it. And quite honestly, I don't think it really mattered who flipped it. You know, I, I think it wasn't really that person's fault. They were put in a situation where there was a lever that they shouldn't have been able to touch. Uh, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like why when trains, uh, everybody doesn't have access to the brake. You know, because like everybody will be touching the brake accidentally. All right, leftover flags. No, this is not my own refrigerator. Um, this is really the worst knock against feature flags, and I gotta agree with it. Um, feature flags are this incredibly powerful tool, but if you keep using them, uh, you're, you'll keep accumulating them. Uh, so I know of people who use feature flags basically for every pull request. That's a lot. I know other people who use them just for uh, major features or minor features. Uh, still, if you're not careful, you can start to accumulate a lot of feature flags. And what happens when you have a lot of feature flags is you're basically accumulating a lot of technical debt. Uh, you're creating branches where, uh, well, you're not creating branches, but you're creating paths that QA might have to test. You're adding ambiguity of how they might interact with other pieces of your code. Uh, and you're, you're just so often actually creating a little bit of risk that somebody accidentally flip a flag they shouldn't flip. Uh, don't have leftover flags. Every time when you're thinking about a feature, think about how long that flag should live. I mean, so this is what ultimately brought down Knight Capital, is that even if they had had a really clear name, even if they'd been better about labeling, they still had a leftover flag when they, didn't, when they should have pulled that flag out a long time ago. Uh, and same with uh, the story I just told about the content management story, content management system, they had a leftover flag that nobody knew what it did. Um, so just like you always have good intentions when you put a leftover in your fridge, uh, when you pull it out three weeks later, you don't want that leftover anymore. <laughs> it's been in their fridge a little bit too long. Um, there are a lot of cases where you would want to keep a feature flag around. Uh, what I've found a lot is that feature flags will cross between being something that a backend, uh, I'm, a developer is using uh, to mitigate risk, to being more of a user setting. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, there's a lot of one-offs in the world, no matter how much you want to avoid them. I've had one-offs where, for example, Morgan Stanley signed a contract with us where they always got this special thing. And it wasn't something that we wanted to put out to the rest of our customers. So we basically had a feature flag in our system that Morgan Stanley always gets this. That was a good feature flag. It was a necessary feature flag because we basically were making that. If you do start to use these kind of feature flags for more user settings, or for, for example, another one is if you want your power users after they've logged in 20 times to get access to a special feature, or if you want, for example, want somebody who buys frequently to get better access, make really sure that you're doing this for a good consistent reason and you're not just having something you should pull out of your code. All right. So a recipe for effective feature flag driven development. Uh, number one, flag carefully. Uh, think a lot about why you're using a flag. And a question I ask right now, I usually get asked is, well, how often should I flag? And my main answer is, whatever your development team is most comfortable with, that's the right cadence. Uh, if you're just getting started with feature flagging, uh, the right cadence is usually about once every sprint so your team gets used to how to use them, how they work for them. A lot of it then also is who gets access to them. Uh, for example, you don't really want your UI team to be able to turn off or throttle a back-end feature. Uh, so think about who gets access, think about why they get access, and build that into your thought process whenever you're starting a new feature. Uh, the second thing you really want to do is you want to lock down access to feature flags. And people do this a lot of different ways. Uh, the biggest, the easiest, the cheapest way to lock down access is to throw them into a config file. This is kind of a trap. Because you might think, oh, if they're in a config file, 
that means that nobody who's uh, not a developer to touch it. However, config files usually don't have much access control on them. So this actually leaves you really vulnerable to a lot of mistakes. Um, if you're using a config file to control access, what that means is that you're suddenly prone to a typo to be able to pull down a release. Uh, also, if you're using config files, you generally have to redeploy to have them, the changes picked up. So it negates the benefit of using a feature flag as a kill switch. So for example, if you um, want to do a controlled rollout and it's in a config file, every time you want to change it, for example, from 0 to 10 to 15 to 20, you have to redeploy. That's, that's quite expensive. Uh, so config files usually seem like a cheap and easy way to lock down access. They're actually kind of a trap that doesn't really get you what you want. Uh, the next way that people usually lock down access is they'll use a database. Uh, this is a little bit better. Uh, however, databases can then also start to be expensive, and I mean expensive in terms of time, if every time you have to check whether a feature is on or off for somebody, you have to make a database call. Um, so the best way to, to lock down access is to really have some sort of system that actually manages it. And also something along with that is to have uh, an audit log. Um, not so that you have somebody to blame, but at least that's so you have somebody to talk to. Uh, so the examples I gave of different teams, <laughs> of different teams using the same flag, of somebody turning a flag accidentally off, none of these were malicious. I don't think anybody wakes up and says, today is the day that I really want to cause a production error and cause people to call my CEO in a panic. Um, usually errors happen because people didn't understand and the system they were using let themselves get into a state where it wasn't clear how something worked. So audit log is really just so that you could go talk to somebody and say, hey, why did you do this? Uh, remove flags. I can't say this enough. Uh, if you're done with a flag, get it out of there. Uh, it's kind of like the old rule of um, if you've eaten your dinner, go clean the dishes. Uh, it seems like it adds a step, but if you don't clean your dishes, the next day you're going to go try to cook and there's going to be all these dishes in your kitchen. Uh, and picture that, except for instead of like a day's worth of dishes, there is 365 days worth of dishes. And not only that, all the dishes from everybody who'd ever uh, eaten dinner in that kitchen. That sounds pretty gross, right? Uh, you're, so clean up feature flags, not just to protect yourself, but to protect the rest of your team. Um, you really want to make it so that you're being a good, uh, a good team member and not leaving around uh, old flags. Uh, a horror story I heard, again, all these I personally heard. I love, by the way, I love bad feature flag stories. If you have any, come talk to me. I collect them. Um, I, I really enjoy hearing them. Uh, so uh, another story I heard is, um, per and this guy, I, this guy personally left his company in his lurch. He'd, um, he basically tuned an entire ad serving system using feature flags. Uh, so basically they were taking traffic in and then reselling it to other people and pushing out just the right ad to the right person. And he'd built all sorts of tuning uh, into feature, f feature flags, but he'd store them all in a config file. So basically, uh, you know, this person gets 10%, this publisher gets 20%, and tuning the mix with that. When he left his job, the next person didn't understand what any of this stuff was for. Didn't, there, nothing was common or documented. So he just turned every, every feature flag to zero. Uh, this was not good. Uh, so basically, um, publishers suddenly got all this bad traffic. Uh, they shut them off entirely. Um, lost the company not a half billion dollars, but probably about 300K in a day. Uh, when my friend told me this, and I say the word friend lo loosely, his, his take was, ha ha, that idiot messed up my feature flags. And I was like, no. You should never have a system that somebody could make a mistake like that. You should have documented these feature flags. They should have good names. And you should have like, left it in a place where your next person understands what they do. Uh, ultimately, his, his, he was kind of, in my, in my sense, he thought the person, next, the person behind him was stupid. I'm like, no, you are stupid 
for letting a fellow developer get in trouble. Like always, always think about the person who's using these feature flags after you and whether they'll be in shape to understand them. Um, so let me, let me finish by telling a story about good feature flags. And then I actually, uh, I left a lot of time because I love questions and I love any horror stories you have. Um, good feature flags, I think, are one of the best tools of development there are. And let me talk about how they help from concept to launch. Any feature is risky at the beginning, and the biggest risk is does anybody care about this at all? Uh, you know, if I have, everybody's felt the pain of you know, pouring a lot of time, maybe a couple weekends, maybe several months or years of weekends, and to feature that it turns out nobody actually cares about. And as an engineer, this is actually one of the most painful things that can ever happen. Uh, this is actually why I became a product manager, because I was tired of building features that nobody wanted. Painful. Uh, with feature flags, what you could do is you could take kind of a baby feature, a proto feature, and start asking a couple people, do you like this, do you like this, do you like this, is this what you're thinking about? Um, the old way of doing releases where you released every three years, this was just simply impossible. Because you would have this, this feedback window every three years, so of course you had to build everything to the biggest extent. If you have an opportunity to build more of a minimum vi viable product, you could build that little feature very quickly, like maybe only in a two days or two hours or two weeks, and start showing it to different people. Uh, the other thing you could do with feature flags is you could do this right in your main branch. Um, in the old days, you would have these branches out, which were very painful because you would have to basically build a branch out and then merge it back in very tediously. With a feature flag, even if you have something kind of half-baked, you can just build it right in your main branch, off, and then control who sees it. Uh, so this is, this is what, for example, we did at TripIt with the email scraping project. We could just push it to a couple people very early. The risk you have after that is will it break out in the field? Like once you've gotten some sort of surety of this is a good feature, people seem to like it, now you have the next level of risk. Oh, and. Not only do people like it, not only do people like it out of the field, but it didn't break all of my other developers' stuff. Your feature's no good if it breaks other features in your code base. Um, then there's the next step, which is, do people who I didn't explicitly ask to see this feature, are they cool with it too? And that's when you can start to do more of a rollout and push it to different people. And then the final usual step that people worry about the most, but actually happens the least, is does it perform under load? Uh, the reason why most, uh, I'll just say this, most people care too much about performance that because the biggest risk any feature has is that nobody ever uses it. Uh, so I think there's always this uh, apoplectic fear that what if 5 million people show up? Uh, yes, that does happen. I've been there. That sucked. Um, usually what's going to happen is 10 people are going to show up. So this is why you test performance blasts at the end, and again, a feature flag helps you. What feature flags help you do with all of this is that you can carefully control who gets access at the right time. So the very early stage, it could be only other developers who get access, then QA, um, then UI usually, and then beta users out in the field, and then more and more and more people. Um, and at every step, you don't have to spin up a separate server, you don't have to uh, you don't have to get people to go to special beta build. It's all just in your unified code base. Uh, but the key to all of this is, if you remember three things, flag carefully, lock down access to who can change them, and be really sure to remove flags at the end. Uh, so questions. Oh, also, if you like a Launch Darkly t-shirt, uh, we have them at uh, just Go to that spot. And I'll, again, emphasize uh, LaunchDarkly is a platform that really helps you with feature flagging. You do not have to use us to use any of the tips I just shared. Uh, we make it easier. But I hope these are things that you can incorporate into your own development practice, even if you don't use us. So questions? <laughs>